بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Make no mistake about it the overwhelming majority of this congregation we are immigrants to America and one of the lingering notions that continuously fester in the minds of many of us that America is home away from home and of course that's the wrong idea I have a problem with that America is no longer home away from home if you have lived in America for the past 25 years or 50 years or 60 years today we have Muslim institutions in America we have Islamic schools. Who would have fathomed that 50 years ago we would have a facade like this that houses Muslims in it? And so America is no longer home away from home. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not prodding the idea or do I condone that we forget where we came from. Far from it. What ails our brothers and sisters in Palestine, or Pakistan, or India, or Sudan, or Somalia, or Nigeria, or Africa in general, or Asia in general, or in Europe, it helps us. And what makes them happy, it brings jubilation into our hearts as well. And so the idea that we should forget where we came from, that's not what I am coming from. But what I am trying to say to each and every one of us, no one put a gun to your head, Muhammad, or Ahmed, or Zainab, or Uthman, or Ismail, and said, is there any way we can tone down the echo? And, and said, that you must go to America. No one did that. We did that on our own free will. After all, there is long lines of people who want to come to America, withstanding the heat of the sun in front of embassies and consulates wanting to come to America. You are already here. So you made an effort, you made a conscious choice, you made a decision to be in America. The problem that came with that decision is we never pay attention that we will be in this country for so long. And that our children will be born and raised in America as well. We never pay attention to that. Our aim when we first came to America, it was to make money or to be educated. But then none of us that I know came to America and says, I'm going to do that one. I'm going to come and build massage. I'm going to come and spread Islam. None of us said that. And so our aims, our intentions were completely different. But we are now in a situation where we're not going back. You're lying to yourself. Because how long have you been saying, I'm going to go back? And it's been 25 years. And for some, it has been 50 years. And for some have been buried now in America. So not only the notion that they wanted to go back, they're not even alive to even make that decision anymore. America is an open society. And I want us to understand what an open society is. An open society means everything goes. There is not a specific dominant culture called the American culture. There is no such thing. And so we must first understand that. The second thing is, our children, whom you see in front of you, that are running in front of you, that sit with you and behave politely, we have made them to have dual personalities. They are not the same kids that are playing basketball and driving the ball to the hoop. They are not the same kids who speak so politely <clears throat> in front of you at home. And guess what? 
for eight hours a day, they're spending time away from you. In an environment that you, the father, and you, the mother, have no control over. And so in the process, we've created a schizophrenic children with dual personalities. They have to behave in one way at home, and then they have to behave in a different way in public. And that's the basis of what we want to do tonight. I'm not here tonight to say to our children, you must behave. You must respect your parents. Don't you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then we turn it into a lecture that demean our children to the point where they listen from one ear and it goes out from the other and it makes parents feel good. Oh, finally someone is bashing them for us. Because Allah knows we can't do it. But tonight we're reversing it. We're telling our parents our children have rights on us. And we need to educate ourselves accordingly. Have you been in this situation before? From tonight on, every situation that happens between us and our children, it must be a teaching moment. It can no longer be a situation. It has to be a teaching moment. You see that? I don't know if some people are sitting way in the corner, or maybe you can't see it. That does sound familiar to some of us, doesn't it? Is that we spend time shouting with one another. Even mothers do. So it's not only the fathers who do this at home, also mothers do this. And we the parents continuously are doing this. And sometimes to prove a point, both parents get involved in what we think is a discipline. Because every moment, while we are raising our children, situations happen. Do we deal with it in such way, or do we deal with it differently? And this usually, the shouting and yelling, is for this reason, isn't it? And I want to tell the young eyes that are here with us, and perhaps they'll see this in the future in tapings. This is what our parents want for us. They want to see us that we are, that you are better than us. We want to see you successful. We not only have burned the midnight oil, we broke our neck coming to this country, a foreign country, didn't even know the language well, and we're always been accused of a bad accent. All of that is for you. But we the parents think the only reason we keep shouting and yelling and putting them through what they say sometimes through hell is because of this reason. This reason is that we want them to study. We want them to be successful, right? And sometimes as we say in America, if we can't join them, what do we do? Right? We can't beat them, what do we do? We join them. Now the question is, we join them, right? We give up everything. We say it is time now to sit with our children and let's have time, a good time with them, right? Is that the right way to do it? Who said no? Why? So what he's saying that rather than beating them, we join them. But then he says, no, this is not the right way. And I ask why? He says that means you have given up and you just are now following them. And you just basically in the process of 
pleasing our children, right? We just want to make them happy. Yaki khalas, enough. Okay, go ahead. Oh, please, just don't drive me crazy. Go ahead, right? That's the indication. But we understand, or I guess we misunderstand, that there is actually a generation gap. The very village that you and I came from, or the country, or maybe the environment that you and I came from, guess what? It is completely different and foreign from our children growing up here in this country. And I mean, there is not even a comparison. My father used to tell me, sometimes waking me up three o'clock in the morning, get up, why are you sleeping? I'm like, uh, because it is time to sleep. He says, my father used to wake me up four o'clock in the morning to go and take care of the farm. I said, uh, we're not farmers. There is no cows. We live in the city. Why are you waking me up four o'clock in the morning? He said, just get up anyways, right? Sounds familiar to you? Or someone would say, we used to walk a mile in the snow just to go, uh, we, there is no snow, I don't need to walk a mile, there is a school bus, <laughs> right? We come up with these situations and ways of talking to our children because honestly there is a generation gap, right? And these are the signs of the time, or have we forgotten, right? Remember, we the parents, do you know what this is? Somebody's laughing. Do you know what this is? How old are you? You're 11, but do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? Do you? Okay, Atari, right? So, how old are you? Nah, don't, I'm just kidding. I played with this. There was no screen, it was a small screen and some numbers are going around and some music and we amused ourselves, right? Today, do you know what this is? What is it? Xbox. Xbox. And if you ask some of the parents, they wouldn't even know what this is. It's an Xbox. So what we played with is completely different than what they played with. And remember your cell phones, right? Remember this? You could take this and throw it at someone and kill him, and this would be exhibit A. You could go to jail with this. That's how bulky they were. Remember this? Now, both of them have been combined into something that's very small. Isn't that amazing? Is that we went from this to this. We like to call them smartphones, right? This is their smartphone. It's supposed to make them smart, right? But our children have been very productive when they use their cell phones, do they? Very productive, right? Even some adults nowadays play with their cell phones all the time, even in khutbah, to zone out. They don't like it. And this is what our children have. They're completely lost in space, right? When you go to someone's house with your children, what is the first thing that kids now ask? What is your Wi-Fi? <laughs> there you go. She's upset. How come my cell phone is not working? Right? Wallahi, Allah is my witness. I witnessed something like this in person, in California. You see that? Today, if you want to get attention of your kids, you call them by their names, they won't answer. You call them on the, on the phone, they won't, but text them, they respond right back, don't they? I was in one of the massages, and after Juma, I came out, and about six or seven of them, they were sitting in a semi-circle. Wallahi, each and every one of them had a cell phone, and this is how they were talking to one another, or maybe viewing something. They were not talking to one another. They were just texting, like zombies, right? Parents, remember your computers? Yeah. Remember that? Do you know what this is? Do you know what an eight inch, eight and a quarter inch floppy disk is? Do you know what a punch card is? 
Remember, somebody said, oh yeah, because you and I worked with mainframes. And debugging, the word debugging, was literally, you have to go inside the computer and take out the rats and the cockroaches because of, it was so big, it's like a room. That's where all the wiring was. Today we have these small things that could run billions of times faster than a huge mainframe that was in a big room. And this is their ideal computer today. And so some of us who are professors and doctors in some of the universities or hospitals, they got used to a complete different environment, to a complete different upbringing, to a complete different professional life. Even the young professionals today didn't even know that something like this existed. But they are very comfortable and familiar with this. Right? So let's begin. And first things first. What kind of car do you like? Ferrari or Lamborghini? Lamborghini. Oh, you're a Lamborghini man. All right. What car do you like? Uh, I guess we'll give you the Ferrari. All right. So we told you, you drive the Ferrari from here all the way to Florida. You don't even have to worry about gas. We'll gas you anywhere you want to while you drive it, and you don't have to worry about stopping, right? How long will it get you from here to Florida? How long, you know, and you can drive as fast as you want. You got food in your car. How long do you think you can get to Florida? 10 hours. 10 hours? Damn, you're you drive fast, man. <laughs> you're faster than a bullet. Remind me to never take a ride with you. How long will it take you if we ask you to drive from here to Idaho? in your Lamborghini. Much longer? Just give me a number. 20 hours? It's usually a, well, a 15 hour ride, but you have a Lamborghini, you probably get there in 12 hours, right? However, him driving the Ferrari ended up in Timpaktu, Kalamazoo. Didn't even go to Florida. And you drove straight to Idaho. What happened? What do you think happened? What do you think happened? Huh? The correct road map. He had the correct road map. And he had the fastest car. He had a fast car, but he didn't end up the right place. And so is life. When you came to get married, what was your aim? I'm speaking to the father, and I'm speaking to the mother. But Umar ibn al-Khattab, it was said that Umar ibn al-Khattab had a man come to him with a baby in his hands. And he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Insahli, how should I raise my child? Advise me. He says, it's already too late. You already have the child. You should have came to me before you chose the mother. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so what vision did I, as a father, have for the future of my children? Because it is already too late to start yelling and shouting with them when they are out. Because something must have gone wrong somewhere. And the problem is we never thought that a day would come when we would raise our children in America because we did not have that road map in mind. And the worst of all, you did not go to the public high school system in America. Some of you may have gone to college, but you already have come to America at an older age. Or maybe some of you came to do your PhDs in America, but you came here at an older age. That you did not have to deal with what the young men and women go through in America. So let's begin with educating ourselves, the parents, first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in Surah Al-Tahreem, chapter 66, verses. Ya ayyuhal a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum na'ar wa quduha al-nas wa al-hijar. All you who believe, protect yourselves. A hellfire that its fuel are men of fake statues. 
protect yourselves and your families. A hellfire that its fuel are men of fake statues and stones of fortune. ويقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كفى بالمرء إثما أن يضيع من يعول It is a voluminous sin, a huge sin for a father or a mother to lose sight of the upbringing of their children. Many people misunderstand this hadith. Yaqut, it could also be feeding the children. In other words, don't be a drunken man, don't lose sight of your responsibility and not feed your children. But feeding them physically is one thing and feeding them spiritually is more important. Right? And this is what the ayah tells us. And of course, this is what the hadith that I just recited as well. And so, all in all, it is extremely important for us fathers and mothers to be educated first. Why? Because a man came to Umar ibn Khattab saying that my child is disobedient and my child does not obey me and he's being unruly and so Umar ibn Khattab being the just man that he is he said bring your son to me I want to speak to your son and so he asked him he said why are you disobedient he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are the rights of the son on the father? He says, to educate him, to marry a good wife, to marry a good mother for him, and to give him a good name. He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, none of this happened. He married a Zoroastrian slave woman. A woman who grew up in a house where they worship fire. Majusiyya. And she did not grow up with confidence because she was enslaved and he never taught me a single letter from the Quran and on top of it he named me cockroach yeah it's crazy isn't it but there are people who go in life doing this you know we call them deadbeat right why because they just marry they have children they leave the woman and the kids and they Escape. They change state, they change country, they change location and never to be found. And the children grow up murderers or, or maybe drug dealers or whatever the case may be. Right? And so here are the three things that the father was supposed to do. Choose a righteous wife. Give a good name to the child. And teach him the Quran which is basically the religion. But instead, he chose his mother to be a slave woman that belonged to a Zoroastrian. First mistake. The second mistake was give him a bad name like cockroach. And he never taught him anything from the Quran. So where do we go from here if we really want to look at how we should raise our children in this country? The first thing is, we need to talk with them and not at them. Wallahi, I'm telling you, if you, the father, found yourself shouting with your child, know that you have reached a point where you have become in the losing ground. A father doesn't need to shout at his children because from baby age, that child was raised in a way to be not only obedient, but to be someone that you reason with for a better future. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala la ibhu li sabah. Play with them when they are seven years old, from birth until they are seven. Wa alimhu li sabah. And from seven until they are 14 year old, teach them. It's a teaching moment. Every time something happens, it becomes a teaching moment. We don't lie. We don't make noises in the masjid. When we go back home, let me tell you why we don't make noises in the masjid. We don't just shout at them. If you ever do this again, I am going to do this and that to you. Right? And then, 
from 14 until 21, they should be your friends. Anything that happens, they come to you. Because now you are their friends. And we will talk in a moment about how, in some cultures, when we don't do that, what is the effect on the child and their future well-being. And the reason I want us to talk about with them, you said, how old are you? 11? You're mature enough. Huh? How old are you? 13. Wow, that's amazing. And you? 16. Okay. Anyone who's younger than 30 back there? Okay. This is, <laughs> mashallah. Yeah, Muhammad Ghazal, mashallah. So this is why. And I want you to read some of this. You see that? 11 years old. And 80% of 15 to 17 years old are having exposure. 90% 8 to 16 years old are having these type of images that come on their computer while doing homework. While on the internet searching. You know, I was in New York City in 1989. And during the height of the drug pandemic that was everywhere, plaguing the entire state of New York, and particularly New York City, the news broadcaster, every 10 p.m. at night, when he comes out, the first thing he would say, it is 10 p.m., before he says hello, before he says anything, and I've heard it myself, he says, it is 10 p.m., do you know where your child is? And now I'm asking all of us, it is 10 p.m. in their rooms. Do you know what they're doing with their cell phones? Do you know what they're doing with their laptops that are connected to the internet? Which is not only a window to the world, it is an entire open garage door to a very, very bad world. Do you know what they're doing? The answer is no. And that's why it is important that we speak with them rather than shout at them. And these are more. 4.2 million sexual websites exist and being looked at daily. 4.2 million. Shaitan is well and alive and very active. Fathers and mothers. Shaitan will always be active. And it will be a forever battle between hot and bottom, good and bad, when it comes to things like this. Read this. The alternative, if we don't talk with them, right, about these type of images and or drugs, I can guarantee you that someone else will be talking with them. And that someone else will teach him some of this stuff and you're not going to like it. And it will be too late for you to even discover it. Right? Teach your kids when they see stuff like this about taqwa to get up and, and move away. We have to speak with them. We have to teach them. If you don't teach them, Akhi, who is going to teach them? If you don't speak with them, who will do? And by the way, do you think the public school? No. Do you think the Islamic school will do it? No. Both of them, they are not equipped to raise our children for us. They are equipped to teach and educate on academic topics and subjects, but they are not equipped to raise our children for us. The onus is on us, parents, to raise our children in America. And it will never happen while we're shouting and yelling at them and kicking them at times, instead of actually speaking with them. And the reason that I do this is because the research doesn't lie. I'm not putting this stuff here to dishearten you and to put fear in your heart, even though I would love for us to wake up, but not to fear monger you, right? I just want us to wake up, to understand what is going on. And this is when one freshman, one of our, um, and I will show you the statistics 
there is an FYI, the DHE FYI. The, uh, it, it's, a, it's an Islamic youth institute that teach parents as in how to cope with, with children who got into drugs or, or got into these uh, uh, sexual behaviors or, or types of schizophrenia and whatever. And he did one of these research and this is what he found. He asked this freshman, hey, tell me what's going on. And, and, and this class were talking and they were giving surveys and one of them says, I watched this while I'm doing my homework. I mean, what else is there to do? This is the children who are growing up in America. I'm not faulting the system. The system existed. The open society existed. And kids who come from quote unquote, broken homes, they are mingled and mixed with our children at the public school. We cannot stop that. And we won't. But I have control over my children and how to educate them. And how to protect them from the bad elements that are out there. And so through teaching them, you know, taqwa, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will inshallah talk about some <coughs> we'll talk about some uh, pointers as in how to actually inshallah ta'ala do that and I want you to read this and I highlighted the words that need to be read I'll translate it in there And so, in another incident, because oftentimes, brothers, we come from a culture where the father beats up the children. Even in this country, it was allowed. In fact, biblically, it says in some verses to beat your children and even your wives. But the only reason maybe in public school they stopped all of this because it was no longer the right way to do it. I have seen children, wallahi, hate their parents. Someone wrote to me as in how much he hated his own mother, <coughs> hated. And someone hate his parents. One girl in Dallas killed herself. And you have to understand that these children go through so much stress. I mean, it's enough stress for them when they go to their public school and in public. Another is to come home and to find a father or a mother that does not understand them either. So they become between a rock and a hard place. And for a, for a young man at the age of 15, 16, when they are discovering their identity and their personality, they truly become in a state of depression. And it is not good for them. And in this incident, Muawiyah was upset with his son, so he sent him to one of the scholars. And one of the scholars sent him back saying, don't be too harsh on your children. They are the fruits of our hearts, if you could say. They are the one who make us whole in this world. We are a sky to cover them, right? And an earth to walk on. And if they become, or they get into the state of hating us, right? And before they become in a state of hating us, give them what they want, sometimes. Right? And we'll explain what that means. Afterwards, they are going to love you. When you become in an older age, they will, inshallah ta'ala, take care of you. And the whole idea is to do it in a wise way, which we will explain in the following slides. But before we go there, I want you to know one thing. Wallahi, the children that you see in front of you, when they grow in a home that does not understand them, when they go to college or when they are old enough to leave your home, they will find a way to release whatever 
hardship that they were going through. And I want you to see this. Because when they go to college, they are far away from you. They are no longer with you. And also, they have reached an age where they are in total control of their lives. It's too late then. Because they are not under your watchful eye. And you don't have any control over them. And so I want you to look at this. Right? 48% of Muslim ladies who go to college engage in premarital sex. 57% are the boys. 19% of girls use what we call illicit drugs. I didn't even know what illicit drug until I went and searched it. Illicit drug is the grandmother and the grandfather or the father or the mother's medicine that makes you high or that makes you sleepy. They buy it and trade it now in colleges. 28% on the boy's side. 19% smoke, 17% uh, smoke marijuana. Girls, 28% is the boys. 19% engage in gambling. And you would wonder, how could they engage in gambling? Don't you physically have to be somewhere to engage in gambling? Not anymore, because they can do it on the internet. Gambling. The handiwork of the devil. And 36% of girls do this. Right? Tobacco, smoking. Including hookahs. And so tobacco includes the cigarettes, includes the shisha, the hookah, right? Includes the vape, includes all the stuff that comes with what we consider to be nicotine. I am amazed that 26% of our girls do it and 44%. But the last one is alcohol, which is clearly stated in the Quran that it is haram to consume alcohol. 48% of girls consume alcohol in college and 45% of boys consume alcohol in college. I personally am a witness in Iowa City, Iowa, where I went to school. I have seen our men and women, Muslims, who sometimes you see them on Friday Salah. Wallahi, I have seen them bar hopping. For some of the fathers who don't know what that is, bar hopping is you would go to one bar and then jump to another bar and then jump until the night is basically over and then you go home. And the reason for that is these bars were in the middle of downtown Iowa City, Iowa. And you have to take that route to turn right and left and go to the masjid. And of course, Salat al Risha, when it's very late, sometimes in the summertime, that's when the bars started to invite people. And you get to clearly see Muslims, Muslim boys and girls, jumping into these bars. Right? And so imagine when we send 10 of our boys and girls out to go to colleges while they're far away from us anymore, the watchful eye, 77.6% engage in one of these activities. That means seven, seven of the 10 boys or girls engage in one of these activities. And what's worse is that 58% are practicing Muslims. That means they pray their five daily prayers. That means they fast Ramadan. Right? There is a problem. And it is there. And we cannot deny it. We can't put our heads in the sand and say, no, it's not there. It is there. And this generation or the generation after will even be worse. The second thing is, Second, the second step towards helping, we need to ask ourselves, am I a good role model for my child? You know, remember that drug or drug uh, uh, commercial, right? When the child, when the father comes all of a sudden into the child's room, and he says, what is this? What is this? And he takes out a pipe, which apparently the child was smoking, drugs in it. He says, Dad, I learned by watching you. By watching you, Dad. Right? And that's the problem. 
I as the father and I as the mother, am I a role model for my child? If my child, the phone rings, and I tell him, oh, tell him I'm not here. Am I being a role model? If I smoke, and my child grows up and wants to have a cigarette, and I can guarantee you would abhor it, you would hate it, that your child, you see your child smoking, are you going to stop him? Or in this case, stop her? I mean, they grew up in your home while smoking. So you can't stop them. If you are okay with drinking alcohol, or that you conduct yourself around people who continuously drink alcohol, it will be okay for the kids to do so. I went into some Muslim homes. I was invited. Ironically, I was asked to give a lecture. They brought all of these, mashallah, well-to-do people in someone's home. And in the basement, there was a cellar. They had bottles of alcohol lined up in a cooler downstairs. It doesn't make sense. Right? And so, am I a good role model for my child? And by the way, Wallahi, I'm not here for a popularity contest. And you may not invite me after this when I say the following. If you are okay with having a hookah in your home, and there is a certain group know exactly what I'm talking about, and you're smoking it, thinking that that sound, whatever, that's just filtering the smoke, it doesn't. It's just to entertain you. And it doesn't filter anything. With all of that, nicotine is getting into your body, and for hours on end, you're smoking this stuff. Don't blame your kids growing up while they go to some college away from you while they're sitting in a hookah cafe out and not in their class smoking. Right? And so to explain that, this is what it's all about. إذا كان رب البيت بالدف ضاربا فشيمة أهل البيت الرقص. If the father of the house was a drummer, what do you think the kids are going to do? They will dance to the tunes. وينشأ ناشئ الفتيان منا على ما كان عوده أبوه وليس الفتى منا بحجن ولكن يعلم التدين من أقربه. Do you think your children will grow up and be ulama or hafaz al Quran, and you are not present, helping them to become so? Because this is what it says, Abu Ala al Ma'arri said, a child grows amongst us only if we want him to be knowledgeable and good character. We, the parents, have to do that, not someone else. And like I said, by watching you, Wallahi, if you are someone who says the F word at home, Wallahi, your children will say it. If they see you shouting on the phone and yelling at people and using obscenity, they will use it. Because they learn from who? They learn from you. And you have authenticated to them that this is okay. And trust me, if your child behaves in a certain way that you don't like, you are part of it. That I can guarantee you. <coughs> the third part, and this is cultural. It has nothing to do with Islam. Brothers and sisters, fathers especially, we need to be just between boys and girls. I don't know how else to say this. And I am very passionate about this. I'm telling you, and I can see the body language of some people, we need to be just between boys and girls. There is no way that we would have a party at home, and then when the party is over, we tell the girls, Go to the kitchen, help your mom. What about the boys? Why can't the boys get up and also go help mom in the kitchen? Why is it in certain cultures that when the boy reaches an 18-year-old or 19-year-old, now we tell his sister, from now on, you're washing his clothing. Why? Why is that? Why do we always aspire to have the boy become the doctor, the engineer, the professor, and then we tell the girl, inshallah, he'll get married soon. Why is that? Don't we want mothers who can raise the future generation to be better people? It is fine if she gets married, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Maybe she herself wants to not have that headache. But we should not raise children that way. I'll give you an example. And the example is, and this was in a very conservative country, and you would know what I'm talking about. 
the mother comes to the hospital pregnant with the fourth pregnancy. And subhanAllah, the doctor says, why? Because she was crying profusely. She was just crying and crying and crying and crying. And then she got it, went into labor. And the doctor says, what is wrong? She says, doctor, you don't understand. When you come to the operation room, I'll tell you. So mashallah, he rolls his sleeves, he goes in with the nurses, and she's, before she gives birth, guess what happens? She says, doctor, I beg you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't tell my husband if this birth was a girl. He says, why? She said, I have three girls already. And he tells me, if the fourth one is a girl, I am going to divorce you. What kind of man is this? Isn't that crazy? So he said, I'm going to divorce you. And subhanAllah, the baby comes and the doctor takes it in the baby basket and he goes to the man at the waiting room and he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a baby boy. And you should see the man jumping and hugging the doctor, taking out the, the reals and giving to the you know, uh, nurses. And he was just tickled to death, very happy. And then the doctor says, but wait, 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 wait. It's a boy, but he has Down syndrome. And we give him a life expectancy of maybe eight years or less. And until that age, he will just be a vegetable. He will just be sitting there. You'll have to feed him. You'll have to change him constantly. He's not going to have any water movement. The father fell on the floor crying and beating the floor and says, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, what have I done? You know, doctor, I told my wife, if this is a girl, I, I wish it was a girl. And subhanAllah, the doctor opens the basket, takes out the blanket and he says, she is a healthy girl. Say Alhamdulillah. It's a lesson to be taught to some people, isn't it? Ya akhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a girl. Yaqul al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. من كان له ثلاث بنات فأدبهن وعلمهن وزوجهن فله الجنة قال ومن كان له جاريتان فأدبهما وعلمهما وزوجهما فله الجنة وقال يا رسول الله وواحدة قال وواحدة يعني even if you have one daughter you bring her righteous you educate her you marry her to a righteous man then الجنة is yours who is your mother is she a female Isn't that amazing that we don't tolerate to have and we look down on girls? Even the kuffar, they used to think that the angels are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which Allah says in the Quran, don't say that. It's blasphemy. And so we need to stop doing this. Right? We feel in some cultures very ashamed that I have a girl and I don't have a boy. Who is going to carry my name? Yeah, who cares? You carry your name. <laughs> Maybe she will give you the next alim that the ummah will benefit from. And you know, Ibn al-Qayyim, he used to say, وَلَقَدْ uh, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Juwazi, he used to say, وَلَقَدْ أَخَذْتُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ مِنَ الشَّيْخَ زَيْنَبَ وَالشَّيْخَ عَيْنِ He used to go to women who were ulama and learn from them. Of course, from wara, wara sitar, but with, with, a, with a veil between him and her, but at least he was learning from women. There are women ulama. We have women doctors now, right? So they are not less than us, and we should not look at women. They are our better half in the society, isn't it? But if we have that mindset in raising our children, then the girls will come up with confidence. And wallahi, it's known that girls take care of their fathers more so than the boys do at old age. We all probably have seen that before. And I can see from some of the body language of some people who come from a culture where women are not necessarily, they're, su they're supposed to serve us. Go get me this, go do this, go do that, right? That's what we want women to do. But is that the way Islam is? Of course not. Is that the way Rasulullah sallallahu dealt with his daughters, Fatima al-Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha? Is that the way he dealt with Aisha radiallahu anha, with Zainab and, and, and uh, with, with Khadija and all the other wives? Of course not. 
And so we need to be yeah, careful. The fourth thing is ask, do our children know their ummah? Just ask right now, what is the concern of our children? Do you know where Palestine is? Okay. Who are the Palestinian people? I'm just, I'm not putting you on the spot. I don't mean to ask you right away. Do you know who are the Rohingyas are? Do you know what they go through? Do you know what happens in Darfur, for example? What exactly? And so, if our children don't know anything about the Ummah, how do you expect them, honestly, to be someone who is going to be well-rounded when they grow up? Right? Again, we brought them and we gave, we, they were born in America and raised here, but they know nothing about their Ummah, the overall Ummah. And so we need to have certain programs, right? We need to take them to Umrah, if we can, or to Hajj. And please, this is what I found the best with my own children and others who did it. Take your kids, when you go to wherever you came from, right? Take them and let them not live in the city. Take them to the countryside and let them see how the people are living. Wallahi, by the time they come back, they will appreciate everything that you give them. And they will understand what's going on. <coughs> and they will engage in uh, activities that help the needy people when they grow up as well. These things make a big difference. يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل المؤمنين في توادهم وطرحهم كمثل الجسد إذا تداعى له عض إذا شك منه عض تداعى له سائر الجسد بالسهر والحمى. Our Nabi says, we the believers, the Muslims, are like one body, right? If your thumb hurts, you wake up all night long and your body is aching. Why? Because your thumb hurts. And so the idea is, if I see any part of my ummah is hurting, I need to see how I can help them. Right? The fifth thing and the last. I'm telling you right now, if you came to this lecture and learned nothing but this last, then I have done my job. Okay? as -salam. Be honest, but we're not holding you. Do you really do your five daily prayers on time? Every day? And so this is a problem with all of our children. Even some young professionals that might be here or not. We're not praying our five daily prayers every day. We're not. Some parents are not praying their five daily prayers on time. They're not. And this is a problem. When our children grow up, all what we want them to be, the doctors and the engineers and the successful businessmen and women, but we, are, we don't want them to enter a agenda. And so if you got nothing from my lecture tonight, I want you to know very much this. How often do I bring my kids to the masjid? Once or twice a week? That's good. Do I bring them to the weekend school to the nearby masjid? I think I should. If they're not in a full-time Islamic school. Every day, if I could, when I am at home and pray Maghrib, do I, after Maghrib, turn around and tell the boys or the girls, can you read one ayah and explain it to us? Maybe just do some translation in whatever language maybe you speak or just in English. Or just read an ayah and I'll correct you. Read one hadith. This is a problem in the Muslim community today that we are so oblivious to what our children are doing. That's one aspect. And the second aspect is we're not taking time to educate them Islamically. And that is the ultimate problem. Now the ultimate problem for me is that our children are not praying. يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا إخواني And wallahi I'm telling you. Something that makes me wake up at night 
sometimes because I know that some of us in the Ummah they're not praying. يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن أول ما يسأل عليه العبد يوم القيامة الصلاة فإن صلحت صلح سائر عمله وإن بطلت بطل سائر عمله. The first thing that Allah will ask you and I is not how much money we made or fame or success. Allah will ask, have you fulfilled your daily prayers? If you did, then everything would be forgiven. If you haven't, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you to accountability. It is the only act or article of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah did not send Jibreel and say, tell Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pray and to tell the ummah to pray. Nay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam above seven heavens and told him Amr, which is he commanded him to pray. And so it's extremely important for us Muslims to pray our five daily prayers and to educate our children to do it. Without it, we're not Muslims. Inna al-ahd al-ladhi baynana wa baynahum al-salah. The covenant between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other faith is a salah. If you leave it, man tarakaha faqad taraka al-deen. If you leave it, you have left the deen. You're no longer part of Islam. And I'll close with this. And these are the ahadith. Allah, ya ikhwani, I'm telling you. We raise our children and we want them. We want them to do what? We want them to be successful. In Virginia, a very wealthy man passed. And subhanAllah, at the burial place, at his graveyard, you could see men and women. He was a very wealthy man by all means of imagination. And so everyone came out, and the Imam stood there, and before he prayed on him, you could see this limousine come across the green lawn, and this beautiful car stops, and two young, handsome men get out of it. They were wearing these $500 loafers and $2,000 suits. They looked like they are the epitome of success. They were the poster child of what success is all about, well-educated. They crossed the lawn and came, and they stood with everyone, and the Imam says, you're the boys, right? I remember you. He says, come lead the Salah. He says, no, no, yeah, Sheikh, it's okay. No, 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 you lead. And then he turns, I said, no, 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 yeah, Sheikh. The second one says, no, no, you lead. He says, if you need to make wahoo, I mean, it's right there. He said, no, 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 yeah, Sheikh. No, no, go ahead, you lead. He said, bye, please, brother, come, lead the Salah. He said, yeah, Sheikh. He said, I can teach you, it's okay, you do. He said, before he starts, he says, yeah, Sheikh, you don't understand. We don't know how to pray. We've never prayed in our lives. Never prayed in our lives once. How could that be? I mean, it's either you're a Muslim or something else. It is the five, one of the five pillars that Islam rests on. If we negate it, our deed is shaky. So these are the things that we as parents, we must engage actively. But without the shouting, without the yelling, I remember one of the well-known ulama that I, that I know, he says, how do you teach your children to pray at younger age? He says, teach them even from three years old. Bring them these small musallah, right? And bring it in. Or in your home, make a room for prayers, congregational prayers, even once or twice a week. And he says, the child will always make noise, he will play. He says, be patient. But every time he says, Muhammad or Ahmed or Zainab or Uthman.